Welcome back to Think Tech. This is Journeys of the Mind. I'm Jay Fidel. Uh, we're talking about Alexei Navalny, Russian history today. We are, of course, at another inflection point in Russian history, and for that matter, because of Vladimir Putin, world history. And uh, for my, my co-host and guest, we have the regular host of Journeys of the Mind, none other than Dr. Carl Ackerman. Welcome, Dr. Ackerman. Thank you, uh, Mitch J. Fidel. <laughs> so, much as lost with this Alexei Navalny, I mean, he, is, he has been elevated to martyrdom now, but for sure. Um, but where did he come from? Uh, what, what was he before he became so special? Well, you know, pretty early in his life, um, he decided he wanted to go into politics. And, um, you know, he became sort of a lightning rod for um, Russians who were dissatisfied with the, with the Putin regime. And, you know, he said, he, you know, what was interesting about Navalny is that he was a Russian nationalist. I mean, he loved his country and that's why he went back. Um, but was, but what was also um, very interesting about him is that he really looked like a Russian and he acted like a Russian. So, you know, it's, it's not as if he was a, a member of my, of, of a minority group. He was, you know, the, the, the real thing. And I think that's what really, you know, he was tall, he was handsome, his wife is beautiful, he is you know, wonderful children. And he's, you know, he, you know, he was, a, you know, a, a big threat to uh, Vladimir Putin, who was getting older and who doesn't look as valiant, um, even though he bears his chest and rides horses as uh, Alexei Navalny. Well, we, we saw him emerge into the front line, the front, the, you know, the, uh, the headlines a couple of years ago. And realized that even in a, a country of serious repression, uh, a country run by a complete autocrat, um, there was somebody who would speak against Putin. There was somebody who would risk his life. And even then, we knew uh, that it was very risky business to oppose Putin. Um, there was this fellow who was poisoned and died in a hospital in, in the UK. Um, there are many people. Uh, in prison in Siberia, who were his political adversaries, um, Putin, Putin, as the, as the culture of Russia has shown us, it's been very hard on anyone who poses, oh, you know, even under the Tsar's time, it's a brutal country. And, you know, you say, well, he was, Navalny was a, a consummate Russian um, and believed in Russia and cared about Russia. You know, if he was familiar with Russian history, he would have known that Russia has been a very brutal country all the way through in recent times. You're familiar with that. Do you disagree? It's, it's not. I mean, the U.S. has its problems, too. Is it had a very, you know, rocky history? But Russia has been brutal. Do you agree? Yes. You know, with, with one exception, let me just take a, a little pause here and go through the, some of the history. And that is, you know, all the way back to um, when the serfs were freed by Alexander II in, in 1861, there was a dissident by the name of Alexander Ivanovich Herzen. And um, he couldn't write freely in country, so he moved abroad. And he was imprisoned, by the way, for a while in Siberia. But, you know, under the czarist regime, things were, you know, not humane, but a little bit nicer if you were a nobleman. He could take his servants and go to Siberia and live, you know, a fairly nice life. Um, even though he wasn't in Moscow or in St. Petersburg. And so what um, Herzen did is he published a newspaper called The Bell in English, Kola Kola in Russian. And he, you know, wrote articles to free the serfs. And eventually, Alexander II will do this. He'll free 50 million serfs in 1861, as opposed to the 3 million slaves that Abraham Lincoln um, freed. And um, he said about Alexander II, um, the famous line from Julian about Jesus Christ, you have conquered, O Galilean. Um, but if we move on, Jay, into, you know, past the, um, you know, socialist revolutionaries into the Russian Revolution, you had a wonderful Democratic Party called the Cadets, made up of a lot of professors. Uh, the guy that I remember the most is Paul Milyukov, who advocated not for the Bolshevik Party, but for a Democratic Russia. 
And of course, in contemporary history under the Soviet uh, Soviet Union, you have you know Andrei Sakharov, you have the Jewish um, people who want to leave Russia and go to Israel, uh, the Refuseniks, um, and uh, you know besides uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, um, um, Andrei Sakharov was much like uh, Robert um, Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, uh, because he developed the nuclear bomb and then decided, whoops. You know, I better I better uh, put a curtail on this in the Soviet Union because we don't want to use nuclear bombs um, because that will be the end of civilization. So, he, you know, you've had a bunch of organized dissidents um, both in Russia and in the Soviet Union. But Putin, under Putin's regime, it's the worst um, because he will kill you. And the, the czars were, as I said, lenient um, if you were a noble person, less lenient if you weren't. Um, under Stalin, of course, it was much like Putin. Um, um, so, I mean, uh, Putin is the new Stalin. You know, I mean, it's just, you know, if if you oppose him in any way, um, you will be either sent to the gulag, um, and that's probably a good choice, or just be killed on the spot. And I'm sure that um, one way or another, um, the, the Putin regime killed Alexei Navalny. Oh, sure. You talk about Stalin. Uh, Stalin was pretty brutal. Remember the Holodomor um, back in the 30, 1933, where he killed tens of millions of Ukrainians um, just to resettle the land with Russian-speaking Russians? And that was pretty brutal. And of course, you know, the whole culture of the Gulag in Siberia, and uh, for that matter, the Lubyanka prison in Moscow. I mean, people went to prison and were subjected to this... Uh, uh, KGB torture, psychological torture, um, until they broke, until they died, and so much has been written and 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 filmed about that. It's been the subject of uh, so much public conversation over the years. But you're right; the more oppressive Stalin was, the more oppressive Putin has been. The more likely you will have underground dissidents. It's like you know. It's like the resistance in France under the Nazis. You know, if you are oppressive, that's what you get. And the question is uh, the tipping point. Um, you know, this was a really bad move uh, at this point in time for Putin to kill uh, Alexei Navalny. Really bad move. And it just works out so that um, it's a powder keg now. And we, we should talk about exactly what kind of powder keg it is and how it may play out. But it seems to me um, that this could lead um, to revolution. And when I think of revolution, I think of Dr. Zhivago. I think of Julie Christie, who I greatly admired in that movie, and Omar Sharif. Uh, and it's a statement, that movie is a statement of the Russian Revolution and how it disrupted everything and how um, you had to run for your life. And so and in, in this case, today, there's no way you can run it. Um, he'll catch you, and he'll kill you, uh, like he did the pilot in Spain, like he did the dissident uh, or the defector in London um, with the, this uh, special poison, and the way he did Naval Navalny with the poison. Um, in any event, it seems to me that this is filtering out into the Russian public, and little by little, they're beginning to understand what a monster and that makes them remember Stalin and the stories from their parents and grandparents about Stalin. And they can't really escape, um, you know, the, the threat of this kind of um, um, brutality. So query, where's the tipping point? Where do we see Julie Christie and Dr. Zhivago rebelling? Where do, these, where do we see the dissidents getting more powerful? Well, you know, I mean, with the with the um, trade with China and, and India, you know, um, things have not been so bad economically in Russia. I'm not good, but not bad. Um, and I think, you know, with Russia's uh, resources, that is natural gas resources, uh, Putin can rely on this. Although, you know, the United States is going to issue in the West more sanctions. But still, I think... Uh, what the key component um, uh, is right now is, and it was similar to the Russian Revolution, is, you know, during the Russian Revolution, of course, there was World War One, And, you know, if 
the Ukrainians are able to survive and get, you know, supplies from the United States, um, this will be, a, you know, an additional burden on Vladimir Putin um, because people are already very dissatisfied and they're losing their husbands, their brothers, their sons. And so I, I think this is going to create an internal pressure. If this coincides with some sort of severe economic downturn, then I think Vladimir Putin is going to have some problems on his hands. Um, Russians uh, do like strong men. Uh, they like, as they would say in Russian, Silny Chilovic, a strong man. Um, and um, as you and I have discussed, um, Jay, you actually sent me the tape. Um, Alexei Navalny made this wonderful um, anti-corruption tape about uh, Vladimir Putin. And he could... He, you know, Vladimir Putin could not allow a guy like this who exposed all of his, not millions, but billions of dollars of corruption. And so my, um, to answer your question succinctly, I would say that you've got one of the issues that you had with the Russian Revolution right now, that's the war in Ukraine. What you need is a severe economic downturn. And we hope that, you know, uh, Democrat, small d, um, will take over in Russia as opposed to something totalitarian like the Bolshevik Party or the Communist Party Soviet Union, right? And that, we don't want people like Vladimir Lenin taking over um, or Joseph Stalin. We want someone like Navalny, who was a Democrat, small d. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a happy thought. Um, you know, the problem is there's no succession plan and it's not going to happen naturally. Putin is going to stay in power as long as he can, and he's going to repress as long as he can. And uh, the likelihood is that there'll be a scramble when he dies of natural causes uh, or whatever causes. Um, and then, you know, the people who scramble are going to be the strong men again, the autocrats, the, the, the br brutality people, and we'll have another Putin. Although I think Putin is really special. Putin is special in the history of Russia. But one thing, you know, is very, there's, there's two things I'd like to mention in response to what you said. Number one is if the United States does not support Ukraine, there's a, there's a chance, um, it's, it's, on a, it's also on an inflection point, that the countries of the EU um, will try to make a deal with Putin and give away part of Ukraine. We know that Trump would do that. And some of the, you know, some of the, um, the countries in Europe will try to do that if there's no support from the U.S. And that, and that creates, a, you know, the, sort of the, an, end, an end game strategy for Putin, and it alleviates the problem of adding a war on his western border, and, and maybe that it improves his prospect. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as you say, if the war continues and if the U.S. supports uh, Ukraine in, in all the ways Ukraine has been requesting, then then maybe that, that creates uh, one of those legs of the stool, so to speak, and puts Putin at great risk at home. Because that, you know, wars cost money and uh, wars cost lives. And these things are eating away at his popularity, even if he does all the things he's doing to maintain that popularity. But the one thing I see is this. We talked uh, in the recent show here on ThinkTech about proxy wars about how people, you know, infiltrate other countries um, seeking not necessarily regime change, but um, seeking to undermine them uh, and seeking to create disruption. And, and he, Putin, does that with us. I mean, it's, it's clearly shown that he has done that, is doing it now, and will continue to do it with Trump's help, maybe for Trump. Uh, which is, you know, they're on the same page, those guys, for reasons that we do not yet know. But here's what I'm thinking. You know, the, the Dr. Javago scenario, a revolution, is not likely to happen within the four corners of the, what is it, 130 million people uh, in, in Russia. It's not likely to happen as things stand. But other countries... Will, will be involved. They will support the resistance. They will support the dissidents, such as the journalists who have run away from Russia and publish about Russia from 
of them in the Baltic states, and I get their emails and their newspapers, so forth. Medusa is the name of the organization, but there are others also, you know, in the, in the Balkans. And so there are people who would, outside Russia, who would support the dissidents, who would support the resistance, who would support a revolution, however you define that. Um, don't you agree? I do. Um, um, pardon me. The one um, um, provision I would have is, or exception, is that, um, you know, Russians are used to living, yeah, you know, one must remember that it wasn't until 1991 um, that things changed and you even had democratic elections. And of course, you had previously democratic elections under the Tsar and the Duma tradition uh, with democracy. And um, so the kind of evolution that would come from a new regime um, would be interesting. And we just have to make sure that, you know, um, that regime remains like Boris Yeltsin had it. You know, I mean, it was flawed, but it was democratic and there were elections held. And, and interestingly enough, Vladimir Putin has to go through an election process, um, which I find... Uh, I mean, of course, he knows that he's going to win. Um, and uh, there, there's kind of an interesting story. Uh, when Dmitry Medvedev um, uh, came to uh, Putin's school, uh, you may remember uh, that there was a brief period when Vladimir Putin couldn't run again by the Constitution, and so he kind of appointed uh, Dmitry Medvedev. And then there was a re-election where Putin could run, and he was asked a question um, at Jim Scott's house, the former president of Putin's whether Putin was going to win. And he said, of course. I mean, it, I mean, and with such surety that, you know, American politicians aren't that arrogant most of the time. Yes, I'm going to win no matter what. Uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe um, Trump during the current primaries, but I don't think he would say, even he would say, oh, for sure, I'm going to win the general election. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, Putin and Medvedev both knew that, you know, if he didn't win, things would be changed so that, that he could win. But um, I am hoping that there will be a uh, regime change as you are, Jay. Um, and one of the interesting things about the corruption um, tape that was in Russian and, and then uh, translated into English that you and I both saw, um, people can find it on on YouTube. It's all about Putin and Navalny as the um, broadcaster or editor or um, person who tells the story, is that even before the former Soviet Union um, things were done by corruption, and the word was poblatu, uh, by you know other means or nalevo on the left. And even though you would walk into stores in Russia and there would be no coffee, uh, there no be, there'd be no fruit. You go to people's houses and there'd be coffee and fruit, and you kind of go, well, how did that happen? And so there's enormous um, uh, chorni rink, uh, you know, um, black rink, uh, black uh, sort of black market um, in Russia, and uh, this fits the tradition. And you know, although what that video is, the extent of the video would shock even Russians. You know, the small amounts of corruption, the small amounts of doing things, as they say, Nalevo on the left, um, Russians would forgive. Americans would not. I, I think Americans would, would um, you know, say, hey, you know, this is corrupt, blah, 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 blah. Even though, you know, Donald Trump has convinced a lot of the Republican Party that, you know, it's just, you know, a, um, a fake sh a charade and, sort of a, a fake prosecuting of him as a, a political entity. Um, the great, the greatest um, statement by an American politician, greatest in the sense that it's totally absurd and it's really, um, it defies all sense of humanity is Donald Trump comparing himself to Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny is a hero and a very brave man. And um, for Donald Trump or anyone, any contemporary, um, to compare themselves to Alexei Navalny, I think is um, uh, just a, a great. Well, disgusting. And the and and the comparisons are Martin Luther King Jr. and Nelson Mandela. Interesting. Uh, interestingly enough, Jay, this is a, something that I think that you would be finally interesting. Is that you know when Mandela was put into jail, his wife took over. And that's what's happening with Alexei Navalny. And she also represents 
you know, the image of the great Russian woman. And so uh, I think she could become very popular like her. Yeah, we have to examine here in this discussion uh, how uh, the, the death of Alexei, the killing of Alexei Navalny changes, um, you know, changes the landscape, changes the calculus in terms of the possibility of the Russian people rising up. You can you think about it? What a tremendous waste the Cold War was. What a tremendous, for them, what a tremendous waste, um, you know, the Cold War number two is for them. If they could only recognize how wonderful it would be, what a great reaction they would get from the West were they to embrace the West, were the West to embrace them. Their economy would expand, their quality of life and personal circumstances, civil rights would expand. It would be a beautiful thing to watch. And sometimes, you know, we, 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 we think maybe that would happen, but I think we delude ourselves, actually, because it's deep in the culture where they are right now. However, they do have a culture of revolution. They do have a culture of rising up uh, against an, an, an autocratic or monarchical, anarchical system. And so um, the possibility exists just as, as a logical possibility. However, <clears throat> Navalny's death, his killing, is an inflection point. And the question I put to you is, um, how does it change the calculus? How could it change the way the Russian people, all 120 million of them, uh, whenever it is, 130, who, who have been subjected to this propaganda for as long as Putin's been there, how does it change their way of thinking? Does it make it more likely that they will rise? I, I think it does. I, I think that, you know, and because who Navalny was as a great Russian um, and how he looked and how Russian, you know, I mean, even if people were too afraid to speak out and, and there are people who have been going to his, you know, setting up memorials and being arrested and, you know, even a woman who gave some money to the Ukraine who went back to Russia who's been arrested, you know, it's it's, it's really crazy. I think that you'll have people, you know, especially, you know, inner police and things like that, well, that will be loyal to um, Vladimir Putin. But I'm not sure how this makes for people wanting to be loyal to um, Vladimir Putin, except out of, out of fear. As long as the economy is, you know, running along, and it seems to be, um, I don't think he's in um, great danger of... Um, revolution as of yet. But as I said before, the war in the Ukraine, if it continues, it's going to continue to, it's already, people are already upset and they don't buy the reasons that they're there. I mean, it's sort of like what happened in the United States with the Vietnam War. I mean, eventually a majority or close to a majority of people said, hey, what are we doing this for? And why are our boys dying? That's happening in Russia right now. Um, but there has to be you know, something going on in the economy that forces Russians to take a look not only at themselves, but at Vladimir Putin. And, you know, if the economy goes sour, um, I think you'll, you're going to see some, um, you'll see some demonstrations mm -hmm. and you'll see some people um, coming out of the woodwork. Uh, well, that's why these sanctions are, the sanctions are really important. I mean, we don't really have control over the economy in, in Russia, but the sanctions could have some effect. They've had less of an effect than we had hoped up to this point, and he has been wily enough to get around a lot of them. But, um, you know, for example, there's, there's a maneuver now to try to take seized Russian assets and convert them to cash and give the cash to Ukraine. Uh, I don't know why Biden hasn't done that already. That would be a good thing. That would help Ukraine, and uh, it would certainly not help the uh, uh, oligarchs. But let me, let me ask you this. Right now, we have... Um, the body of uh, Alexei Navalny is held in a small town in Siberia near the prison where he was killed, where he was incarcerated and then killed. And in my view, he was killed because he was such a threat as revealed in that video you mentioned a minute ago, the one in Russian, the one that goes on for an hour, an hour and a half about, uh, you know, the corruption, the incredible corruption by the hundreds of billions, uh, all in favor of of Putin and his friends, that is such a threat that he had to be killed. 
So that, that gets out. That's part of the calculus. That video, which is all in Russian, gets out, and it is explosive. When you see that video, you realize the, the depth and scope of the corruption is like never before in the history of the world on a relative basis has there been corruption of, of that depth and scope. <clears throat> but there she is trying to get his body. Now, uh, the, uh, that, the drug they used on him before, what's it called? Do you remember the name of the drug? Um, I just seem to remember that it was somehow tied to nuclear a, activity, or you know, it was, it was radioactive. Yeah, it's a, yeah, I think so. And and it's a it's a it's a weapon that that only the army has, and all you have to do is touch it, and you're dead. And so the army has to deploy it. It's not like you know they can get some contractors. No, no, no. It has to be somebody very well experienced. So okay, um, uh, so the the point I make is that she's in this town trying to get his body so she can do a chemical analysis and figure out how they killed him. Um, and in the previous poisoning thing, uh, the Russians withheld his right to leave Russia until, I think it was 48 hours, um, so that the poison they gave him would pass through his body, al alive or dead. It would pass through his body. It would be undetectable. That's why they held him up. And that's probably why they're holding his body up now. So she can do the chemical analysis she needs to do uh, with her experts to find out how they killed him. Because uh, over time, it becomes more difficult. Okay. And they say, well, you want his body, you're going to have to agree that the funeral will be secret. And we'll put him in a grave, very quiet funeral at the edge of a cemetery, no press, no nothing, nobody invited. And if you agree to that, we'll give you his body. Of course, that's probably not true. They won't give, give her his body because they have to wait out whatever period of time that was. It may be 48 hours. It may be a month. Um, but that's the proposal they made to her. And she's sitting on that right now. She's deciding that question right now. I care about my husband's body. I want to know how he died and what you did to him. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, she would have to capitulate with a, a theoretically a deal. She would have to capitulate and, uh, and agree to a secret, secret funeral. I find that so interesting. Secret funeral is what is what they want from her. So, my question to you, and trying to elevate her to stand in Navalny's shoes. And to be, you know, within the ambit of his martyrdom, and to have the, the people continue to protest, you know, and be dissident. The, the Russians and Putin—they're trying to let the news cycle move to something else, right? He's an expert in that. And intervening news—they will forget about Navalny. He can't be a martyr, you know, in a month or two. If he's going to be a martyr and some effect through her, Yulia. It's got to be now. So if, if you were sitting in a room with you, what advice would you give her um, about this dilemma uh, that Putin has presented her with, the agreement he wants her to agree to? You know, it's hard to, you know, it'd be hard to give advice to a, to, to a wife or to a mother. Um, but I would say he, but the biggest political impact, um, you should insist on um, a large, uh, you know, a funeral like in Moscow or St. Petersburg. Um, and, um, otherwise allow the body to go to the West. Um, and then you can, you know, have, you know, a huge gathering where, you know, it'll be impossible for Putin to suppress a gathering in the West. But I wanted to come back to your original, um, 1917 revolutions analogy, because there was another, there were other deaths in uh, Siberia, and that was the Tsar and his family, uh, who the Bolsheviks killed. Um, children, you know, uh, uh, protectors, nannies um, in Siberia also. So the, the parallel is, is, is pretty um, significant. Well, bury him in a grave. If, if I were her, 
and I have another question after this, but if I were her, no issue. Um, they're not going to let her find out what chemical agent killed him, what what other brutality they used on him. They're never going to let her find out. What, whatever deal she makes, that's never going to be available to her. But if she says, no, I'm not going to do that, and what she can do is organize a funeral in Moscow, somewhere, a populated place in Russia. And she can point out that they have never given her the body back. They have made it impossible for her to get the body back. So we're going to have a, a public funeral in absentia. And that would enhance his martyrdom. Don't you agree? You do agree. I do. Not to put it any but in jeopardy, I would probably do it in the West. Um, but you could do it just as effectively. And you can have a lot of the dissidents who are in the West, um, you know, uh, Masha Gisen and, you know, a variety of writers and come to the to the thing in the West and then broadcast it in Russia. And, you know, people will understand, as they did where I started, um, Alexander Herzen couldn't publish his paper in Russia, so he published it in London. Um, and so, you know, I, I think this is, the remarkable thing is that his wife has taken up the banner because um, it's it's really quite um, a burden, um, but she has. And uh, well, I, I worry about her. If he if he killed the volley, and she takes up the banner, she's at great risk of being poisoned or killed. In the same way, you know, maybe who knows? Maybe she falls out of a plane like Prigozhin, um, or the, in the case of the Spanish, the, the Russian pilot in Spain. He was shot dead by some people with guns in the street, uh, you know, and it's, it's deniable as far as, it's always deniable as far as Putin is concerned, but we connect the dots. We know that he, in fact, everybody's making public statements to that effect. Now, your point about moving this whole affair, this funeral in absentia, into the West, I think it's a good point, because she doesn't take the same risk, although, you know, the truth is, Putin can chase her anywhere and kill her anywhere as he has with various dissonance in the past. But she'd be safer, say, for example, in Germany. Germany would protect her. And so if that's the case, it wouldn't be quite as effective in terms of dealing directly with the Russian people, but it would be sustainable. She could do it and continue to do it uh, for a period of time. And she could use news channels, including the journalistic organizations that have moved out of Russia and are publishing about Russia uh, from, say, the Baltic states, you know, where they where they are now. Medusa is the example. I give. <laughs> and they're very effective. So uh, with technology, with telecommunications, with the Internet, that would be the best bet, I think, uh, for her to maintain the martyrdom, maintain the dissent, maintain the protest, because she could actually do that and with the, with the technology, she could reach the Russian people one way or the other. Do you agree? I, I completely agree. And I'm thinking about, you know, speakers who could be, you know, quite profound and um, you know, even national speakers. I mean, l let's say she gets uh, Joe Biden in there, you know, um, so, you know, or the prime ministers of France or Germany, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I think it's, um, um, Jay, I think it's, uh, um, a great idea, but I'm, I'm glad, um, during this show that we had the opportunity to talk about, you know, other Russian martyrs like, uh, Andrei Sakharov, uh, Alexander Herzen, um, the cadets, um, the refuseniks and others who, you know, refuse to, um, obey either the czarist or, uh, Stalinist system, but of, of the three, that is the czarist system and, and, uh, Stalin, I think that um, Stalin and Putin are on the same level, which says a lot about Vladimir Putin. You know, it strikes me that whatever she does, whatever the U.S. does, I mean, assuming that Joe Biden stays president, hopefully not would, um, there's a lot to be said about unearthing the corruption that Putin has been involved in. It's not just money corruption. It's the corruption of these proxy wars. It's the corruption of feeding weapons. It's the corruption of uh, being a rogue state. He's created a terrorist state, a rogue terrorist state. Uh, and he's 
buddied up with other rogue terrorist states. And this has to be revealed to the world. Now, Joe Biden and the intelligence community in the U.S. could help with that. It wouldn't make you know any better friends with Putin, but hey, he's not our friend anyway. So what's the problem about revealing more about what we know? And the intelligence community is so uh, tight-lipped about this that, that we must know much more, and that could come out in the case of uh, Julia's efforts to convince the public, the public, public in Russia, um, you know, that they should vote against him, vote against uh, anybody but him. Um, so, you know, there is a chance at getting some democracy, some fresh air into Russia now, now at this inflection point, now with her, now with her out of the country and being supported by journalists who left the country and other Russians who left the country for whatever reason. We know there are hundreds of thousands of them that moved into, you know, the South, the, the former satellite countries of the South and Central Asia and so forth. They're there. And they don't like what Putin is doing. They don't like the war. Um, and if the U.S. got on board and Western Europe got on board, uh, it could be a fantastic propaganda war. And maybe it would work. Your thoughts? Um, I think it's I, I think it's very true. And I just wanted to um, tell our audience uh, two things. One is that if they see the the video, um, I think this video is extraordinarily important, but also the video that uh, Navalny made. Um, Actually, Putin has assembled a hit, a hit squad, um, and he names the names of these people in this hit squad that, you know, that if, if you're causing problems, you will, um, you, you know, you will, you will see the consequences um, um, if, if you're in Russia or, or not. And also just to tell our audience, you know, it's just wonderful to have an organization like Think Tech Hawaii. And um, so I urge people, if you want the news that you can get like this, um, about Russia, you should go to Think Tech Hawaii. You should support. You should not only watch the show, but support um, financially or otherwise. Think Tech Hawaii, as headed by the men. Well, I want to make a, a one last statement, Carl, if you don't mind. Uh, you know the the fact that uh, this fellow Smirnov, who fed disinformation um, to the government and caused a number of members of Congress to go after Joe Biden with a, an attempt to uh, impeach him. It was so outrageous. And then to find that Smirnov, who is fluent in Russian and whose wife is fluent in Russian or girlfriend, um, you know, uh, they have close Russian ties. And the, the, the disinformation came from Russia. It came from the intelligence organizations in Russia. So he was, you know, directly linked. So, you know, what you get is Liz Cheney's statement that the GOP, now the MAGA GOP, has a Putin, a Putin wing. Um, and a Putin has got his hands around Trump. For some reason, Trump is, is dedicated to Putin and uh, apparently indebted in some way. Um, and Johnson works for Mike Johnson works for Trump. And then the whole MAGA organization works for Trump. The base works for Trump. So all of what we've been talking about, the inflection point, and whether Navalny's death will resonate, uh, could resonate among the Russian people, it depends on what happens uh, in, in this election. Heather Cox Richardson wrote about this really filthy uh, connection between Trump uh, and Putin and Johnson and a number of members of Congress who follow, follow Trump. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the one thing I would leave people with is if we elect Trump again, my God, uh, we are going, you know, Ukraine is lost. Putin is elevated. Uh, Trump will do what he can to allow Putin to essentially invade Western, rather Eastern Europe and Western Europe. Um, and so the future of the world really hangs on the election here in this country. And I would say to anyone who is even a tiny bit inclined to vote for Trump for any reason, um, better take another look at that because it has implications right into what's going on in Eastern Europe. Really heavy rack and pinion implications. That's my closing well, they, statement. You, well, you're, you're, you know, your comments are made by Nikki Haley um, also. And I, I realize that she 
running. So, you know, it's not a Republican versus Democratic thing. Um, it's it's a silly notion to dissolve our NATO ties. And it's a, it's a unproductive and dangerous notion to um, allow anyone to do what Vladimir Putin did in the Ukraine, whether you're a Democrat, small d, whether you're a Republican, whether you're an independent. Um, it, you know, it rings so closely um, to the invasions of um, what was then the East uh, by Adolf Hitler. You know, I mean, you know, you got to stop these guys and you got to stop them quickly. And the only thing they respect is strength. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a notion that's really in some sense larger than, uh, than politics. It's just common sense from what we've learned in, um, in history. And, and, uh, you know, for anyone watching that, uh, watching this show, that's when the word appeasement, uh, became a bad word, uh, during World War II. And we cannot appease Vladimir Putin. That's my last word. Okay. My last word on your work is Shakespeare. The question for the country now is to, it's not political. It is to be or not to be. That is the question. Thank you so much, Dr. Carl Ackerman, for this interesting discussion about the implications of the killing of um, uh, Alexei Navalny. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aloha.